Good evening. My name is Deb Kometi, and I'll be your moderator for this class. Welcome to another lecture presented by the Syracuse New York class. <clears throat> this is a school and not a church, and neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non denominational, religious, and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley in the state of Ohio in 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year 1958. We hold classes in the United States and certain other foreign countries. The Syracuse branch was established in 1969. The president, I'm sorry, the dean of our Syracuse branch is Dr. Patrick Trevison. Our president is Dr. Robert Welch, and our vice president is Dr. John Cometti. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title of the Word or Son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. And the name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means Elohim is the title our Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name, but it's an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part in a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a J in the English language until some 1400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings of the true and original name of our Father and His Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He's the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state, symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself, because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn the cloud all around the edges of the chart. And everything on the chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, he took on shape and he took on form right within himself as Yahweh Elohim. This is the Word or Son, a super incorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man but without flesh and blood. This form could only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there's only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in this school we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it's Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, he called Moses atop of Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly as he had seen it in, 
exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up this one tabernacle pattern. Also in this school, in this school we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern, and absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The primary constitutional objectives and aims of the Institute are as follows. One is to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as he really is and actually exists. Two is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity and Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Three is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Four, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Five is to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seven, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eight is to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Nine is to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And ten is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is to speak the truth. Tonight we'll have a prayer by Dr. Scott Miller to dedicate our class. That will be followed by our scripture reading, which is Genesis, the 10th chapter, verses 6 through 20. And that will be read by Dr. Scott Miller. And uh, I will be the second scripture reader for the class. Double duty. You want to call me? You want to call the speakers? Mm hmm. Take a moment, bow our hearts and minds to our Heavenly Father, Yahweh, through His Son, Yahshua, and ask that He allows us to focus on tonight's lecture and get the cares of the world out of our minds, because we know how easy it is to not focus on class sometimes, and that He allows us to internalize what's being said and just gives us another piece of that puzzle that we're so earnestly desiring to you know or whatever question we had that a little piece gets answered tonight and that we go out into the world and manifest his love and and glorify his great name and with that let's say hallelujah, hallelujah. <clears throat> all right tonight's scripture will be read out of the holy name bible containing the holy name version of the old and new testaments Critically comparing with ancient authorities and various manuscripts revised by A.B. Trina of the Scripture Research Association. Genesis, the 10th chapter, verses 6 through 20. And the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizram, Put, and Canaan, and the sons of Cush, Seba, and Havilah, and Sabta, and Ramah, and Sabteca, and the sons of Ramah, Seba, and Dedan, and Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty hunter, mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter opposing Yahweh, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter opposing Yahweh. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. Out of that land he went to Assyria, and built Nineveh, and the city streets, and Kala, 
and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala, the same is a great city. And Mizraim beget Ludim and Anamim and Lahabim and Neftuim and Pathruzim and Kazalim, out of whom came Philistim and Captorim. And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Hath, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Gergesite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Shenite, and the Arvadite, and the Zemurite, and the Hamathite. And afterward the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar, unto Gaza, and thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adma, and Zeboim, unto Elisha. And these are the sons of Ham, after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. And that's Genesis 10, 6 through 20. Well <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I got all those names right, but I gave it my best shot. <laughs> all righty. Is that the right distance? Mm -hmm. I will be the first speaker. <clears throat> and um, I was thinking we would try to work with this chart somewhat tonight. And we never know what the weather's going to be like next Saturday, and already they're, it's beginning to look a little dicey. So, due to the fact we never know whether we can get here or not, uh, and there are some people that have asked me to touch on a couple things, you know, from around the country that don't ordinarily get to hear some of these different things, you know, like you folks always do. And I've read so many things lately in all these different magazines, you know, and I had to go through them and just pick out three today out of about 10. Because it was just too much stuff to work with even though there was not that much underlying. There was just too much stuff. I'd just been reading it and putting it aside and putting it aside and thinking, when this time of year comes, we're going to work with all these things. But there's no way. You just can't do it. Mm -hmm. Now, this scripture reading, and he did do well reading those names. <laughs> I know sometimes Sharon Welsh reads, you know, <laughs> on Sunday morning and stuff, and she read, tries to read these things. It's, I mean, it's just unbelievable. And actually, she's one of the better speakers on Sunday morning. Uh, probably what we should do is just go to I try to get away from this because it, it's time consuming. Go to Daniel, the second chapter, and start reading in the 36th verse. And uh, we'll try to skip down through some of this stuff. Daniel 2 and 36. This is the dream, and we will tell its interpretation before the king. All right, now Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, who had had a dream, and he could not remember the dream, and he didn't know how to interpret it. And none of the wise men in his country, none of the seers, none of the wizards, nobody had any idea how to do this, you know. So... Anyway, it ends up that Daniel is able to do this. 
And Daniel is going to tell the king what the dream is, and then he's going to tell him what the interpretation is. So go ahead and read. This is the dream, and we will tell its interpretation before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the Elohim of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. So Daniel's talking to Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel is from the tribe of Judah, and he's in captivity in Babylon. They were taken into captivity in Babylon a hundred years after the, the nations of Israel or, or the tribes of Israel were taken in captivity in Nineveh. See, Nineveh's up here. That's Assyria. A hundred years later, they're taken in captivity here in Babylon. Okay? This would be modern-day Iraq here. Iraq. Mm -hmm. And then this would be Persia here. This is modern-day Turkey. This is Israel. This is Saudi Arabia. This is Egypt. Okay? Just to give you some geographical idea of what's going on here. Then you have the Aegean Sea, and you have Patmos here, where John was on the Isle of Patmos. That was here. You have Greece, you have Rome, you have Italy, and then there's no more map up there. This is the north coast of Africa, okay? This is Russia, and Russia plays into modern day events. So go ahead and read. I'm sorry to keep interrupting you, but just so you and the people that are watching have an idea of what's going on here. Go ahead and read. And wherever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heavens hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. Now he's saying... To Nebuchadnezzar, thou art this head of gold. And on Mitch's chart, you have a man standing. Because it's the same in the 40, 40 foot chart. Yep. Okay? They had a, a man standing, and I think it's, it's labeled apostasy. And they have a man standing, and he's got a head of gold. He's got a chest of silver, he's got a, an abdomen of brass, and then he's got the legs of iron and clay, okay? But it's just a man standing there like this. It's, a, it's that way on Mitch's chart and the 40 plate chart. But here they have that man, the same man, but he's stretched across a geographical area. He's stretched across the ancient Mediterranean kingdoms. There was a lot that went on in ancient times in these areas. A ton that went on. That we can't even deign to be, to touch upon. But go ahead and read. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. Now this kingdom inferior to Babylon was going to be Media Persia. And they are going to conquer Babylon. Although Babylon never dreamed they would ever be conquered. Never dreamed it was possible. Go ahead and read. You know, just like we sit here tonight, and we don't think we're the most powerful country on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. We are. And we don't think anybody's ever going to conquer us or, you know what I mean? And we go to bed every night and we're pretty comfortable and that's the same way they felt. That's the same way they thought. And all of a sudden, boom, just like that. Gone. Those walls were gone, but that was, that was it. Go ahead and read. 
And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and an another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Now another kingdom of brass, which was Alexander the Great. It says here, Grecia, which is Greece, which is Hellenistic, which was Alexander the Great. The Macedonian kingdom, or the Greek kingdom, which bore Uh, rule over all the earth, just like he said there. They went all the way into India, all the way into Afghanistan, all the way into Egypt. I mean, they did incredible, incredible things that no army's been able to do since. How long did we last in Afghanistan? Twenty years. Twenty years, and look at the men we lost, and look at the money we lost, and look at the armor and everything we ended up leaving there. Right. Alexander the Great conquered the country without any tanks or any of that stuff. <laughs> That's why they still teach his tactics at West Point today. Read. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. Now the fourth kingdom, which is Rome, will be strong as iron. We're not going to get into the clay, into this and that, and all that stuff. Just, just understand that there's two legs. One represents pagan Rome. One represents papal Rome, and one would be strong, and one would be weak. Part of iron, part of clay, it reads in there, okay? In other words, the pagan was weak in that it only lasted till 476 AD, and then it was conquered, and then papal Rome took over, and they're still in they're still in action tonight. They're still making money tonight. Mm -hmm. They're still in power tonight. Still going on. And in the Middle Ages, they had a lot more. What they have now is the papal states. Okay, it's just the Vatican state. It's a tiny little state inside Rome. It's its own sovereign state. Everybody understand? Very tiny. But at one time in history, that was not so. They owned vast lands all over the place. And they had countries helping them beat other countries so they could take their lands. These were popes. Men who are supposed to be about God's business. Not amassing fortunes. Do you understand? But that wasn't how it worked. So, that represents Rome. Pagan and papal. Now, skip down to about... Um, Oh, I don't know what verse to have here. Let me get it here. I'm trying to expedite time. What? Well, I don't want to go there just exactly yet, but we are going there. Pick it up in uh, 44, yes. 
Daniel 2 and 44. And in the days of these kings. Now in the days of these kings, okay? Shall the See, when it, when it got to be down to the, to the, <clears throat> the papal times, the pagan and the papal times, you had men like uh, Augustus and Herod and Cleopatra and Caesar, Julius Caesar. They were all, they were all cronies. They were all buddies. They were all pals. They ended up all going to war with one another, but at one time they knew one another. Herod knew all them. Herod was a great builder. He built the temple there, you know, that got destroyed by the Romans. Anyway, in the time of those kings, those kings, read. And in the days of these kings shall the Elohim of heaven shall the Elohim of heaven Yahweh Elohim Yahweh Elohim Read Shall the Elohim of heaven set up a kingdom Now he's going to set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed which shall never be destroyed. Now I'm going to leave that there for now. I'm going to come back to that, okay? Mm -hmm. But now we're going to go to the scripture reading. Because he talked to Nebuchadnezzar and he said, Thou, O king, art a king of kings. Thou art this head of gold. Right? Mm -hmm. So, we want to see what's going on with this head of gold. Which is why we're going here in Genesis. So Genesis 10 and 6. And the sons of Ham... Cush and Mizraim. Now, this is after the flood. Here we are. It's after the flood. Right? Mm -hmm. And here they are, after the flood. These, it's Ham and Shem and Japheth. They were the sons of Noah. And you can read about the other sons of, you know, their prodigy and their kids and everything. And it kind of gives you a little inkling and an idea of where these people ended up going and how the earth got populated. Okay? Not quite yet. But how it's going to get populated? Read. In the sons of Cush, Seba and Havilah, and Sabta and Rama, and Sabtaka, and the sons of Rama, Sheba and Dedan, and Cush begat Nimrod. Now, Cush means darkness. That's what it means. Okay? And if you do some studying, you'll find, I believe, that the African peoples came from Ham, the Hamitic people, the, or from Ham, or from Cush. You do some studying on your own, Google it, see whether or not it's accurate. Although not everything on Google is necessarily 100% accurate. That's right. Yeah. Go ahead and read, Peg. Or, um, uh, Deb, I mean, John, I mean, <laughs> Scott. And Cush. <laughs> and Cush begat Nimrod. And now, here we go. Cush begat Nimrod. 
So Nimrod came from the loins of Cush. He comes from darkness. He comes from, from, he comes forth from darkness. And because Ham uncovered his father's nakedness up here, it wasn't him that was cursed. It was Canaan. We can get it in the book. It said it says, Cursed be Canaan. Let's get it. If anybody could uh, pick that up quick. Oh, it's a 25. Uh, Genesis 9 and 25. Genesis 9 and 25. Very good. Pick it up in 24. And Noah woke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, um, he had too much wine. I could pick it up at 20 if you wanted to read the little story. <laughs> he pretty much said that he got covered his nakedness. That's well, go ahead. Go ahead. All right, I'll pick it up. 9 and 20. And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. Yep. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment, and laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backward, and covered the nakedness of their father. So they covered his nakedness. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ham showed them his nakedness, but they covered his nakedness. Read. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. Hmm. And Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan. No, he said, Cursed be who? Canaan. Canaan. Cursed be Canaan. Now this is important. So now go back to the scripture reading and continue reading when, where you left off. And we're in verse 8. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a So mighty. Nimrod was a mighty one in the earth. And you picked it up in the in the, the, ninth. the Bible you were reading up here. The sacred name, right? Picked up what? That it said he was opposed to Yahweh. Yes. Yep. In that, yes. in the holy name. Yeah. Yes. That's good. Right here. Uh, yeah, hunter yep. opposed, opposing Yahweh. He was opposing Yahweh. He was a mighty hunter opposing Yahweh. Nimrod was opposing. Yahweh. You see, Nimrod comes forth from the, the, this lineage. He's coming from that lineage. And he's cursed. And he opposes Yahweh Elohim. He is an adversary to Yahweh Elohim. Read. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter, before Yahweh. The mighty hunter opposing Yahweh Elohim. Right, even as Nimrod, I'll read it. In the, he was a mighty hunter opposing Yahweh. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter, opposing Yahweh. Opposing Yahweh. Read. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. No. Now, the beginning of his kingdom, and there it is right here. There's a reason why all these things are on this chart. There's the Tower of Babel. And it, look, you see it's got a cloud up here. Clouds signifying that they built this thing to reach up unto what? 
heaven. They wanted to get up to heaven. That's, that's Satan wanted to get above the Most High. You understand? And here it says Nimrod. And it says Tower of Babel. The beginning of his kingdom, and here it is, it's lining right up with this head of gold, was Babel. That's the beginning of his kingdom. That's the beginning of his kingdom. Read. In the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kelna, in the land of Shinar. Out of that land went forth Ashur and builded Nineveh. And he built Nineveh. In the city of Rehoboth and Kala. You understand? They built Nineveh. The same ones. They built Nineveh. Which later on in history is going to, you're going to read all about it when you read the story of Jonah. You're going to read all about Nineveh. And those people are in captivity up there in Nineveh. Read. And resin between Nineveh and Kala, the same as a great city. And Mizraim begat Ludim and Anamon and Laabim and Naphtuhim and Pathruzim and Kelzim, out of whom came Philistim. That, that, that's the Philistines. Philistines. That's the Philistines nations. Okay? See, some of these you can recognize. Some of them, I don't know who they are. You know? I mean, I just don't know who they are. But go ahead and read. And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite. And the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Gergesite, and the Gergesite, and the Hivite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, Sinite, and the Arvidite, Arvidite, and the Zemurite, Zemurite, and the Hamathite, Hamathite. And afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. And these were the families of the, look, Canaanites, and they were spread abroad. Those were the peoples that populated Canaan land, mm -hmm. named after their father, Canaan. You see? Mm -hmm. So it takes the mystery out of what the heck's going on there, and it just makes it simple. That's what this is all. That's what this is all about. That's why Yahweh Elohim told them when they go in there, these tribes are to be. You understand? Be expunged. Get them out of there. Why? Because they're cursed and have no part with them and don't intermarry with, with them and don't worship their gods and don't go up to the groves with them. Why? Because they're cursed. But did they listen to Yahweh alone? No. You see? In other words, this is the whole purpose beginning to unfold here. And that's why we're taking the time to, to do this, see? Now, that's, that shows this, you see? Adam fallen and coming down, and then the serpent coming forth, and he's got the crown on his head. And he's coming forth because these are his kingdoms. Way back over here in the corner it says, Cain, city of Enoch. So this was there before this was there. This was there 
before the flood. This was there before the flood. Before Ham uncovers his father's nakedness. That existed. And that's why Yahweh Elam destroyed the earth with what? Water. You see? So it's 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 just this. In color. <laughs> <laughs> Really, when you, you know. So it's talking about all the. These are the sons of Ham, after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. Okay? And we'll just leave it at that. Now. You see, you have a picture here. This is the Sphinx. And you see, look at, there's that, there's that pyramid. And this was talked about recently that it says in there 2520. There's that 2520 again. And you can pick that up in the numbers that are in the tabernacle. It was, I believe, 1,260 inches from the gate to the ark, and then 1,260 inches back. So 1,260, 1,260 is 2520. And it was worked with differently when we were in Lansing. Do you remember? They worked their different kinds of ways. I'd have to go in there and look at my notes and stuff. But anyway, it was worked with several different ways. I'm not a math genius. But there's a reason why that number's painted on those pyramids. And it's painted on the pyramid here. See that pyramid down there? Mm -hmm. What's it say? 2520. 2520. It's there every time. Now this is the Sedia Gestatoria. It's written right out there. For those that are watching, it's S E D I A G E S G E S T A T O R I A. It's a raised seat that they carried around in ancient Egypt and in ancient Babylon. They got see they got the idea from here. Look at it all comes out of Babylon. All of it comes from Babylon and spreads everywhere. Spreads into Egypt, spreads into Israel, spreads into Canaan land, spreads into Persia, spreads into Greece, spreads into Rome, pagan and papal. Everything that was back here. And they carried that that king back there was worshipped as a god. Nimrod was worshipped. He was worshipped as Dumuzi or Tammuz. The Hebrews called him Tammuz. And his queen was worshipped as Ishtar, the queen of, guess what? Heaven. There you go. See, this stuff's not hard. Queen of Heaven, that's where it all begins. And then there's a queen of Heaven in Persia. Her name's Inanna. Then there's a queen of Heaven in Grecia. 
Her name's Aphrodite. You've heard of Aphrodite. There's a queen of heaven in Rome. Her name's Venus. And then there's a queen of heaven in papal Rome. You've heard of her. Mary. Her name's Mary. And there was a queen of heaven in Egypt. Her name was Isis. You see, they all, the name has changed to protect the guilty. <laughs> but the, manifest, the manifestation changes, but the principle stays the same all down through history. And it, just like they had that Sedia Gestatoria there, they had the same thing in Papal Rome yep. until the founder of this school sent the textbook out and had a picture of the Pope being carried around in it with that tiara crown and showed the 666 on it and showed him being carried around on this sedia gestatoria just like they had the pharaoh just as they had transported the pharaoh back in ancient egypt they stopped doing it and they took that crown off the pope and put it in storage in other words there were some things that were revealed about the Catholic Church that they didn't like. Do you understand? And so they tried to hide it, hide those things from the people. Now here's a she-wolf with the twins Romulus and Ramus. This is mythology now, okay? This is true. You can, you can find all this out. You can find this out too. But this didn't actually happen. But the mythology is that Romulus and Ramus were nursed by a she-wolf. And Romulus slew Ramus, his twin brother. Where else have you heard that happening? Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. Romulus slew Ramus, and the name Rome comes from Romulus. That's where the name Rome comes from. So that's why that's painted on there. And as I had told you, the Pope in the Middle Ages was always at war with, he, France would back him, and he would be at war with Tuscany, okay? And then the Lombards would back him, and he would be at war with the Sicilians. And the Sicilians were always at war with everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and then and the the, the 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 folks that lived in Naples were always at war with everybody. Do you understand? All these different areas and the Pope would always was always conniving to get them on his side against this one or that one. But England, the King of England, was always on his side was always on the Pope's side. So he was called the defender of the faith. That's a title that the Pope, that the, uh, the King of England still has to this day. He's still referred to as the defender of the faith. And I want you to check that and make sure about it, but I'm telling you, he still holds that title, even though they broke 
with the Catholic Church way back in the 16th century. Back in the 1500s, Henry VIII, he wanted to uh, do away with his Catholic wife and marry another wife. And the Catholic wife he was married to, she was a relative of the King of Spain who gave a lot of money to the Pope so the Pope wouldn't let him do it. So he left the Catholic Church and formed his own church, the Anglican Church. Everybody follow? And there were a lot of wars in England for centuries. Catholics against Protestants and, and you know, Mary Queen of Scots and all kinds of stuff which you'd never remember in a million years. Okay? But they were always at war. Always at war. The Protestants and the Catholics. Those good Christian people. <laughs> murdering and slaughtering each other. Babies, children, didn't matter. You understand? So that's why this is painted on there. And this was part of the Roman Empire up to Scotland for a very long time. It was called Britannia. And London was a Roman fort. <laughs> that huge metropolis now, that center of world banking, it, it was, it began as a little Roman fort. It's amazing, this stuff. Defender of the faith. So there's a reason why, and we'll get maybe get into the, all these animals up here, okay, if we have the time. Now, um, let me go to Daniel, the seventh chapter. Beginning in one? No. Let's, let's. I hope this isn't too tedious and too. Uh, um, let's see, Daniel 7 and. and I let it go again. I think around the seventh verse or so, I'm not sure. Daniel 7, 7. Okay. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. Okay, wait a minute, Deb. Um, yeah, read it, I'd read it at one, seven and one. Uh oh, we got, we have the master reader here now. We, <laughs> <laughs> he wants to go all the way back to the first verse. All right, start in one. Okay, Daniel 7 and 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. Now here we have the, the king of Babylon now is Belshazzar, which I believe he was Nebuchadnezzar's son. Okay, go ahead and read. Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till its wings were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth. Now the first beast had what, Dad? It was a lion. Now look, see this beast? It's a lion. And he's got eagle's wings. So the lion represents Babylon. 
And if you look at the things that they've unearthed there, the ruins, uh, they have sculptures of lions and bulls. You know, that the way that they sculpted was very muscular, you know? And they, they have sculptures of these things. You can see them. But the line represented, look, a line is a representation of the tribe of Judah, which was the kingship tribe in Israel. That's what it represents. But the mystery of iniquity, he's going to he's going to have representations using animals too. That's what he does. Go ahead and read. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till its wings were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and its, made... its wings were plucked by Persia. Read. And it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Now, you see, this line today would represent Iran and Iraq, see? In modern times. And you would have to follow uh, current events to see what was going on in the Mideast with those countries to understand why they have power and what they're doing and Iran is selling arms to Russia and they're developing nuclear power again and you understand there's all kinds of shenanigans going shenanigans going on in the Middle East it's it's nightmare there you know the Shiites hate the, the Sunnis and they're all they're all Muslims, they're all brothers, supposedly, but they hate each other. They butcher each, they butcher each other whenever they can. Read. And behold another beast, a second, like a bear. Like a bear. And it raised up itself on one side. Look, and see how it's raised on one side? There's a reason why these critters are painted up here the way that they are. It's raised up on one side. Now the bear is a symbol of Persia. It's also a symbol of Russia. Modern day Russia, their symbol is the bear. Check it. See the hammer and sickle painted up there? This chart was dated. This, this is when this was the Soviet Union. <laughs> it hasn't been the Soviet Union for quite some time now. But go ahead and read. And it had three ribs in the mouth of it between its teeth. See the ribs? Read. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. Devour much flesh. It destroyed Babylon. And in modern days, look what it's doing to Ukraine devouring much flesh. So not only is it following historically, it's following current events. It's devouring much flesh. Now you've heard in the news recently about Crimea, how Russia went in there and took Crimea from Ukraine. That's that little peninsula right there. That's what Crimea is. It juts out into the Black Sea here. And in ancient times, there were Greek colonies around here, and there were uh, Roman colonies around. There were all kinds of different people jostling and fighting one another to, for power all around here <laughs> because they wanted to control these lands. another whole story <laughs> there are people today that believe that Russia is the third Rome which is another whole lecture okay go ahead and read after this I beheld and lo another like a leopard 
which had upon its back four wings. See, there's oh. a leopard. Here's four wings. The beast also had four heads. Four heads. Did now the leopard that? represents Grisha or Alexander the Great. Read. Dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night vision. See, because after he died, his empire was split up among four generals. I could give you their names, too. I think it was, uh, I know it was Ptolemy, Seleucus, Lysimachus, and I believe Antigonus. I got them written down somewhere. Nope, that's not where I have them written down. But I believe those were the four Greeks, generals of his, that divided his empire up. Okay? Check it out. Check up. Check out Ptolemy. P-T-O-L-M-E-M-Y. Ptolemy. And you will find that that general of his, those, they held sway over Egypt. That was his part of the empire. And they held that for three or four hundred years until Cleopatra committed suicide and she was the last Ptolemy. And that was it. Then it was all Rome's. Rome took over. But read. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly. Strong! Yeah, look at him! He's terrible. Strong exceedingly. Read. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue with its feet. Look, he stamped all these empires. He took all these places over. All these light colors are places that ended up belonging to the Roman Empire. Plus England, plus France, plus Spain, plus stuff that's not even on this map. Go ahead and read. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I ten, ten horns. Now there's a reason for the ten horns. Read. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before which there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. And a mouth speaking great things. That represents the papacy. It spoke great things. Great things. And there's a, there's a place in there where, I think it's in Daniel, it says where they, to change times and seasons. And they even changed the calendar. Didn't they? Yeah. To the Gregorian calendar. Uh, we're going to leave off on that for now. We're going to go from there to the 13th chapter of Revelation. And one. Yes. Revelation 13 and 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and now, two horns. Now, this is John, right? Yes. Yep. Now he's having this revelation. Mm -hmm. And he has turned. And he sees a beast rise up out of the sea. Now, you understand, he's turned. See how he's turned? Panoramic vision of Yahweh Elohim to, to John. 
He's turned this way. Moses is turned this way. So he has to confirm Moses' vision. He has to confirm it. John has the Holy Spirit in him. This is 96 AD. This is after the day of Pentecost. 60 years after the day of Pentecost. So he's turning and he's seeing the, how the purpose had unfolded. He's seeing the purpose from beginning to end. And he's understanding the purpose. Moses saw the purpose from beginning to end, but had no understanding of what the purpose meant. Because he did not, not until the day of Pentecost, did anyone understand the purpose. And that's why here, his arms are closed. He's got that purpose hid up inside himself. But here, where's his arms? Here's the purpose. Here it is. And here he is bare. And here he is glorified. It's all different. It's all different, and yet it's the same. It's such an amazing thing. But here's John, and he's turned. And he's on the, sword, the seashore, and he's seen this beast rise up out of the sea. Right, Deb? Read, please. Having seven heads and ten horns. Oh, I'm sorry. Scott was reading. I was reading, yeah. <laughs> and upon his horns, ten crowns. And he's got seven heads. And upon his head, what? Ten crowns. Ten crowns. Now, listen. The beast represents... This beast... Well, you got pagan Rome, you got this beast. Look, you got this beast. You've got these seven, how many crowns? Ten. See, so having seven heads and ten horns. Seven heads, ten which horns. are the seven hills of Rome. Now listen, I want to read to you. I don't know if I've done that here. I think I have. I'm going to do it again. Someone asked me to do this. The seven hills were the... See, I wish I had a blackboard, but I don't. The Capitoline. C-A-P-I-T-O-L-I-N-E. The Aventine. A-V-E-N-T-I... N E the Saline C A E L I A N the Esquiline E S Q U I L I N E the Palatine P A L A T I N E the Quirinal, Q-U-I-R-I-N-A-L, and the Viminal, V-I-M-I-N-A-L. Did I go too fast for anybody? If you want to see these afterwards, you can. You could see the spelling of them. Now, hey, having seven heads. Is that right? Now it's because Rome sits on seven hills. The seven heads represent seven hills. The seven hills of Rome. And I've given you the names of those hills. And you can check those names 
for yourself. And you should check those names. Now continue to read, uh, Scott, please. Okay. Having seven heads and ten horns. Ten horns. Now hold on. Those ten horns represent ten kings. The ten kings that originally gave the Pope his power. Or it was the dragon giving power unto the beast. You can read about that in Revelation. I, I don't remember exactly where it is. The dragon gave power unto the beast or something to that effect, okay? But they were ten kings that the Pope had these ten kings that helped him be established and begin to have territory and money and armies and you understand and war with other peoples and I'm going to give you the names of those ten because they're not the names of kings but they're the names of tribes and those tribes had kings and those tribes ended up becoming countries. The Franks, F-R-A-N-K-S, which later became part of France, much of France. Mm -hmm. The Lombards, we got a store in Syracuse, it's called Lombardi's. It's, uh, you go there and there's all kinds of great sausage and cheese and stuff hanging from the ceilings. Right, John? Yep. It's, a, it's, a, it's Northern Italy. Mm -hmm. Big, huge region in Northern Italy. So that's, to this day, it's still Northern Italy. The Visigoths. They were Spain. They were the Goths that were in the West. Visigoths. That's V-I-S-I-G-O-T-H-S. -I -I then you had the Ostrogoths. O-S-T-R-O Goths. They were the Eastern Goths. And they went and formed parts of Italy, parts of Eastern Europe, parts of Russia, parts of the Slavic nations. The Vandals, you've heard of vandalism. These guys, when they went somewhere, they just wrecked everything. That's where the word vandalism comes from. They ended up in North Africa. So the countries in North Africa, you know, like Libya and uh, Morocco and Tunisia, they ended up forming from some of these tribes. The Anglo-Saxons, you can all spell Anglo-Saxons, I hope. They formed parts of Germany, and then they emigrated to England until they were conquered in England by the, uh, the French who came up from northern France there, uh, uh, Normandy, in uh, 1200 and something, there was a big war and the Battle of Hastings and anyway, you can read about it. Battle of Hastings, okay? Google it. Google Anglo-Saxons. Google um, uh, 
what did I say, uh, the northern French? Normandy. 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 The Normans. The Normans invaded. Okay? Uh, the Huns. Eastern Europe. The Huns. Well, Attila was one of the big kings. And at one time, the, one of the popes had to go out and plead with Attila to spare Rome. And he did. It's true. The Heruli, H-E-R-U-L-I. They ended up being parts of Eastern Europe and Scandinavia. The Suevi, S-U-E-V-I, and the Alemanni, A-L-E-M-A-N-N-I, formed Germany. And the Burgundians formed, you've heard of the wine, right? Burgundy? Comes from where? Burgundy. France. France. It comes from a part of France. They they are still a part of France. Okay, Burgundians. Those are the ten. Those are the ten horns. So these things that are written there, it's not so that you'll think everything is weird and mysterious, and there's a reason for it. And it's all based in history, and it's all stuff that can be checked. My wife helped me check all these things. So, where were we? Oh, we were reading in Revelations 13 chapter. We never got out of the first verse. Well, we had explained the seven heads and ten horns. Yeah. That's, there's a reason why there's seven heads and ten horns. See? On these beasts. Yeah. It, go ahead and read. Okay, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns. And upon his heads the Ten name. crowns. Why? Because they became nations. Do you understand? Read. And upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. <laughs> and upon his heads, the name of what? Blasphemy. The name of blasphemy. Read. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of Wait, a bear. The beast I saw was like a leopard. Mm -hmm. Read. And his feet were as the feet of a bear. Oh! feet of a bear and his mouth is the mouth of a lion and the mouth of a lion now this is John way down there in the Isle of Patmos hundreds and hundreds of years after Daniel way way after Daniel and he's talking about the same thing Daniel saw in his vision. Talking about the same beast. Right or wrong? Yes. Right. I didn't make it up. I didn't put that in your book. Read. And the dragon gave him his power. And the dragon, there it is, gave him his power. Now who's the dragon? Satan. That's Satan gave him his power and his seat and great authority and great authority who the Pope gave him great authority the dragon look at him gave look at the dragon gave him you understand great authority read and I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. 
and his deadly wound was healed. That's good. I want to get Revelation 17 real quick. Start reading in one. Revelation 17 and one. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now the, the great whore. This is the judgment of the great whore. You see her painted here? That's the great whore. And on Mitch's chart, he's got her painted on his charts. She's on the 40 play chart, the great whore. And uh, here she is here, painted here, painted there. I don't pick her up anywhere else, but go ahead and read. Um, come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Upon many waters. What are, wait a minute, what are many waters? People. People. And you've seen those, those films when the Pope would come out on the balcony and all those people are in St. Peter's Square or Mussolini would go out to speak with those people or Hitler would speak to those people, you know, at Berchtesgaden or those places and there'd be those just hundreds of thousands of people just captivated and they're like this. You understand? Looks just like waves. Watch them, watch those old films sometimes. Read. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Made drunk with the wine of her fornication. The inhabitants of the earth. Catholics. And from Catholics branching off, Protestants and evangelists and Presbyterians and, and Anglicans and all of them. And Judaism and Islam and all the religions of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And in Mitch's church, she's got a big chalice. She's sitting there with a big chalice. And there she is. She's got the chalice. She's holding it. Yep. Yeah. She's got that cup, that golden cup. See, and all these nations have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. What's the wine of her fornication? What is it? False, false doctrine. doctrine. False doctrine. Lies. False doctrine. People are drunk with it. And people right now in school are drunk with it. Drunk with it. So drunk, they listen to something, they go, that's right, that's right, that's right. They don't check it, they don't, no, not anything. There's no research anymore, there's nothing. Read. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast. There you go. See? Full of names of blasphemy. Full of names of blasphemy. Having seven heads and ten horns. Seven heads, ten horns. Yep. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. And purple and scarlet color. And decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Yep. And now that's good. Now I want you to go to the 18th chapter and start reading in one. I know we're into a lot of stuff in Revelation here, but... Okay, Revelation 18 and 1. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven. Having now hold on before you read this. 
let me tell you about this this island this small small island of Mot Motya M O T Y A off the western coast of Sicily so it's right over here and it's so small that it's not even on this map okay it's very small It was in the middle of a sea route in ancient times. There was a lot of trading that went on. And it was settled by the Phoenicians. And there were Greeks and there were Etruscans and there were all these, uh, these different people that were settled there. You understand? Before Rome was even a, a village. And this is uh, 800 years before the birth of the Messiah. And they had a religious culture uh, entwined with their everyday lives. Uh, I, I, listen, they worshipped Baal and Astarte. It's right here. It's right here. And they had this huge sacred pool on this island and right in the middle of it it's still there you can go there today get on a plane and fly there and go see it there's a statue of Baal right in the middle of it I'm telling you some things just have not changed this National Geographic It's, it's so hard to just uh, refer to some of these. This is dealing with Stonehenge. You all know where Stonehenge is, don't you? This has got some beautiful pictures of it and stuff. They're trying to still determine how this thing was built and who built it and, and what was going on there and all kinds of things. There's a picture of a guy right there. You see him? Hugging that wall right there. Just like they do with the, the wall over there in Israel. The Wailing Wall. He's a Druid high priest. And he's hugging the wall. Asking the wall for to answer his prayers. And th th these things, see, there's a picture of Stonehenge at night. People still go there at times of the year like this. This is the winter solstice. Uh, in a few, in a week or ten days or so, yes. mm -hmm. which is going to be the shortest day of the year, right. and you know how it is right now, you know. Yeah. You, you, by the time it warms up enough outside to be able to do anything, the sun's gone. <laughs> yeah. It's out there for an hour or two. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And uh, the days are so short. And you come to class now and it's dark out when you leave home. And it's, it's dark when you go and you, some of you go to work in the morning and it's dark out. And you come home at night and it's dark out. That's no fun at all. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, the days after the 25th, they start to get longer again. 21st, 21st the winter solstice, okay? And that's on that, uh, that figure eight, the way that the sun works up in the sky. The solstices, 
in the equinoxes. And you can look at that and see how that works. And uh, in ancient times, the people would get scared and think that the sun was going away and they were going into darkness. And the people, the priests who knew, you know, used that to, to their advantage. They used it to exploit the people's ignorance and rule over them. The kings and the priests. Anyway, the days would get longer and so they would worship the sun. And a lot of it has to do with sun worship. Oh my goodness, do I dare go there. There's, there's, there's so much more in here. Look at these people, they're just worshiping at Stonehenge. On the evening before the autumn equinox, a crowd of Druids, pagans, and pilgrims gather to chant and celebrate the change of seasons. Be happy you sit where you sit. These people believe this. They believe this with, with their hearts. Now, this is a British archaeology magazine, which I signed up for by mistake. I don't know. <laughs> but, but it's got an interesting thing in here. I must read it to you. I think it is fairly well accepted that there is a link between Inanna Ishtar, who we talked about, mm -hmm. and how she was understood in Mesopotamian culture in southern Iraq. There's Mesopotamia written right there. And how those ideas of passion and warfare personified in female form spread around the Mediterranean and impacted on other cultures' ideas. This gave rise to the goddess Astarte, who was worshipped from around 1000 BC by the Phoenicians, who we just talked about. She, in turn, is believed to have influenced the Greek goddess Aphrodite, who we talked about, who then becomes the Roman Venus, who we talked about. See, these things you can verify. This is a highly respected archaeological magazine, although Everything in here isn't accurate either. They're way off on some of their dates. You could take carbon dating and whatever. <laughs> These ideas do change and evolve slightly as they move through the different cultures to incorporate different cultural norms and perspectives so we can see how these spiritual ideas transform. Reference, reverence for a mothering role is frequently found in religious belief. One of the best known examples is the modern world must be in the world, modern world must be Mary, who cared for the baby Jesus. Devotion to the Virgin Mary has been widespread in Europe since at least the 12th century, way before that. With a heightened interest at that time, perhaps reflecting the growth, growing 
prominence of queens and aristocratic women during the era. Uh, I'm going to skip, skip, I'm going to skip over that, skip. Just to show you, okay, these things are accurate that we're talking about here. Nevertheless, you should know them for yourself. Now, uh, now, Revelation 18. Um, so 18 and 1, Revelation 18 and 1. Yes. And after these things, 